Hey, good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for coming to church. We're excited about what God is doing here. Sarah just talked to you. A little bit of a different schedule here today because we do have communion, so I get to come out and talk a little bit earlier. And uh, coming out earlier doesn't mean longer. Don't worry. Uh, it's actually supposed to be shorter. Nah. No, it really is. But no, we're so glad you're here. We really mean that. And if you are new, I'm Jason. Love to, uh, to meet you after our service here. Uh, we're in to week three here of, of, of launching our second service. And, and that's con, con, it's only been two weeks. This is the third one. And it's been larger every week. It's only been two weeks. Really? Okay. <laughs> So anyway, so it has been better. So keep praying for that. Thanks for being a part of that. Uh, freeing things up for uh, volunteers. They can serve one, come to another ch- uh, service. And so it's a, real, it's a vision thing. And so we're excited about it. Just an update there. Uh, hey, I'm excited about uh, today. I'm excited about week three also uh, of Sticky. And what we've said in Sticky uh, uh, is it's, it's about being someone that others want to emulate. And what we've defined Sticky as is uh, someone uh, who would walk into a room, and even though they don't need announced, everyone knows that they're there. It's not about being popular. It's not about being, uh, you know, holding the biggest stick or swinging the biggest stick in the room. It's, it's just simply someone uh, who has lived a life according to God's standards in such a way that God has used them to become an influencer. They become what we call Sticky in a very, very simple way. Now, we've talked about that. If you've heard any of the messages, I've explained that. And what we've done is we've looked at virtues of stickiness. And so in week one, uh, we looked at biblical honor. A person of honor is a sticky person uh, over the long haul. And then we came back last week and we talked about integrity. A sticky person has biblical integrity. It's important. It's a foundational for us to be sticky is to have integrity. And I tell you something, my prayer has been is that God would ignite in us a vision, ignite in us a heart to become a sticky church, a church where there's just a bunch of people who are serving Jesus together and becoming sticky over a long haul, right? And that's my prayer. It's what we want to be as a church. Now, today, I want you to know uh, up front, I want you to know that today uh, might be a hard message for some. Now, some of you push back and you say, well, you know what? You said that last week. I know. I'll probably say it every week. But it might be a hard message for some because in this message, it's going to require that we accept where we are and keep going. It's going to require that we're okay with the living in the tension of not yet or maybe no. Pardon me. I am battling the stuff that's going around. Anybody else? I'm not sick now, but I'm super congested, so I may cough a lot. Where was I? (laughs) Or maybe no. But we still live with the promise that it's going to come true. And the promise is is that we're going to see Jesus as a community together. We're going to see Jesus face to face. So I want to talk with those of you today who feel like quitting who feel like maybe throwing in the towel and giving up on that purpose and giving up on that calling. Maybe it's in your marriage. You feel like you've been pressing it for years and it, or months or whatever, and there's just no response, and you feel like throwing in the towel and quitting. Maybe it's uh, on a dream, quitting on a dream that you've had, and, and you, feel, you feel like you've gotten to the point now where there's no reason to keep going and, with the dream and giving up on that. Maybe it's a ministry that you feel God has given you, but it's not working out, and so you feel like throwing in the towel. Maybe it's an addiction that keeps resurfacing in your life, and you know that you, you feel completely uh, uh, barred in, right, uh, when you're in the middle of it, and yet you want to find freedom, and you find freedom for a while, but you just kind of leak back into that. And the truth is this, is that we all have struggles. We just, let's just be honest. Can we just be honest with one another? We all have struggles. We all have our hang-ups. And we all have very good, justifiable reasons for throwing in the towel, for quitting. And so today what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about the, the principle of faithfulness, principle of perseverance 
together. Lawrence talked about perseverance a few weeks ago, and this is kind of, you know, B to it, if you will. And, and I wanted to talk about it in this series as well. The principle of faithfulness and perseverance. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 37 uh, say this. It's up on the screen for you, but let me just read it here. It says, so, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Let me just say that. Let me just read that again. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. And then verse 36, you need to persevere. I feel like there ought to be just a a period right there because we need to hear that. You need to persevere. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. So a simple translation to those verses, which encourage our souls, hopefully, right? Uh, A simple translation uh, would be what uh, one lady, her name is Angela Duckworth, calls, describes it as grit. There's grit behind it. You need to, writer of Hebrews says, persevere. You need to keep going. You need to keep trusting. You need to keep believing. You need to hang in there. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, right, that path that God has laid out for you, uniquely for you, it's going to vary from mine and mine from yours. But when you've done the will of God, when you've walked that path over a lifetime, when you've done that, you will receive what he has promised. There's hope in that. There's truth in that. There's reward that is coming. You need to to persevere, to be faithful. I mentioned Angela Duckworth. Uh, She's a Harvard uh, uh, graduate, an Oxford uh, Institute graduate. Uh, And she did a study, she did a study that just simply asked the question, why do successful people succeed? Like, what was it about them that made them successful? Uh, And she looked at three different categories of people. of of people. One was a a very famous military school, and she looked at there and she said, okay, why do do people that went to this military school succeed, and why do some drop out? She also looked at inner city school teachers, and she was asking the question, uh, why do some teachers make it through the inner inner city school system, and then why do some drop out? And then she also did spelling bee champions, which I thought was really funny, but she was really looking at this idea of being intellectual, right, and trying to get these different ideas and different samples of people, and she, she was trying to see in them, why was it that some rose to the top and some did not with, with good intellect? And what she found out through the study was it had nothing to do with their IQ, but rather she called it their AQ, and the AQ stood for adversity quotient. In other words, it was people that had the, uh, the, the determination to overcome what was difficult, right? It was how much and for how long they could persevere. It was an IQ, it was AQ. And she wrote this book called Grit, and she defined grit this way. It was passion and perseverance for long-term goals. It was passion and perseverance for long-term goals, In other words, something that excites your soul, something that gets you going, something that causes you to be passionate, right? And and all of us have those things. But it wasn't just passion. It was the determination, the perseverance over the long haul to see it through. So it wasn't just short term. It was long term. And I believe that is exactly what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that you need to persevere, So that when you have done the will of God, long term, when you've done that, you will receive the rich reward that he has promised. It is long term. And so we're not doing perseverance in a short term semester. We're not doing perseverance in a short term uh, 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 season, but rather it's long term. We're talking about people. This is perseverance in the real world for us. We're talking about people raising a child with special needs. Long term. 
We're talking about someone serving Jesus when you have a chronic illness that just will not go away. We're talking about people who show back up when it's easier to walk away. We're talking about believing God for your marriage when they're distant, believing God from your, for your children when they've walked away and you're waiting for them to come back and you're persevering in faith. We're talking about long-term perseverance. You need to persevere. You need to be faithful. I can almost feel and sense the, the passion behind the writer of Hebrews as, as he writes those, those words. And so my prayer for us, my prayer for us is that we would allow God to develop in us a faith that would move us to faithfulness, to trust him, to persevere. And let me tell you something. You know people who have been faithful for many years. You know them. Guess what they are? They're sticky. Because you want to hear their story. And you want to know why their faith is so rich and so deep. So if you have your Bibles, turn. That was our, our big picture text. I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 6. We're going to put some things up on the screen here. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. You'll see it through there, right, in the Old Testament the book of Joshua. And you you guys might know the story by the time we get to Joshua 6. So here it is. Let me just tell you the context. Uh, The Israelites are the subject, right? The the main characters. Uh, The leaders of those main characters are Moses. And then as we get here in Joshua 6, uh, it's uh, Joshua who's leading the Israelites. Now, if if you know your Bibles, you know that this is kind of what's been going on. The Israelites have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, They've been promised that they would enter into a land uh, flowing with milk and honey. I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful land. But they've been wandering for 40 years, and Moses was their leader. Well, when we get here to Joshua chapter 6, uh, Moses, for, and we could, I'm not going to talk about this now for time, but Moses had been told by God because of events that had happened that he was not going to see the promised land. So Moses died. Uh, they went into a time of grieving for Moses. Uh, they then consecrated themselves and they went in to take the land of Canaan that God had promised with a new leader. And his name is Joshua. And Joshua uh, was the one uh, that was going to receive his first assignment here in chapter six and really leading the people of God. And so if you're the Israelites right now, you certainly had a time of grieving, yet at the same time, at the same time, you're excited. There is hope. There is the promise right in front of us. We are going to move into the promised land, and God's going to use Joshua to take us there. And we're about to go into the land. Excitement is there. They are ready. This is it. God's promise is about to unfold right before their eyes. And with that context, let's look first at Joshua 6, 1 through Five And here's what it says. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. Just I want you to notice that they were securely barred. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing their trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So I want you to notice right there in our passage, and we're going to go down and look at some other verses here in verses 8 through 14 in a few minutes. But I want you to see what's happened in the first five verses. The promise is there. They're about to receive it, as I've said. Joshua from the Lord has given the orders. And they're about to go in. And they're about to win. And they're about to take down Jericho. Now, what's interesting to me is you see in verse 1 and verse 2, and I'll go there in just a minute, you see a weird dichotomy. There is a promise of God but then there's the process of God before the promise happens. And I believe, 
I believe that many times we give up, we throw in the towel because the process becomes too difficult, we think, to endure. And so we walk away from the Lord. We walk away from the promise. We stop being faithful and we do not persevere because the process. Why? Why is it, and here it's up on the screen, why do we give up? Why do we give up? Two reasons. Number one, let me just, we'll just talk about it. We give up because I believe our view is limited. We give up in the process because our view is limited. At least I do. Right? I, mean, I mean, if I can't see it, I've, I've, I've often said to people and my wife, I realize I've got to stop saying this, but as long as I see God working, I can keep going. Sometimes we don't see God working uh, in the process, right? And so God's taught me that, but our view's limited, but God is still working. So here's, here's what we see. Our view is limited. What we know about Jericho is this. Jericho is not a very big city. In fact, you could march around Jericho in about an hour or so. It's not like it's hard to get around. So they could do that, no problem. The problem wasn't the width the, or the, or the uh, circumference of the city. The problem was that the walls were too high. That was the problem, right? The walls were too high, and so they couldn't get over the walls. There was just this huge problem, right? And so you can imagine the Israelites, uh, they're close to the promise. It was just another side of the walls, right? But they can't get over the walls, right? I find that interesting. Now, you might be able to relate uh, to that, right? You've kind of gotten to the place in your life, like, all right, this, I'm right to the promise, but then you're hitting obstacles, right? You're hitting stuff really hard. And because you're hitting stuff, you feel like you'll never get in and receive what you believe God has given you, right? But our view is limited. I want to go back to verse 1 and 2 like I said I would. He says in verse 1, the gates were securely barred because of the Israelites. They knew that they were coming. No one went out and no one went in. It was locked tight. No one could get in. And then in verse 2, God says to Joshua, I've already given it to you. I've already given it to you. You can't get in it, but I've already given to you the city. Now, why did he do that? I heard a great quote, and it was this. God is the only one who can speak in the past tense before the present reality. That's good. God's the only one that can speak in the past tense before a present reality. And so God spoke that way. He's the only one that can tell you what is when what is isn't yet, right? He's the only one that can do that. And so some of you might be in a situation in your life right now as you walk into our church this morning where what he says about you is different than what you see about you. It's how you feel. What he says about you is different than what you feel about you. You see, you might say, and other people might say, well, God has blessed me, right? But you say, I don't see God working. God has blessed you. He's working. I don't see him working at all. And that might be where you are. Why is that? Well, I believe in a large part because our view is limited. We just can't see completely what God is doing, doing. And so the Israelites, don't forget this, didn't know the end of the story. Did not know the end of the story. God told Joshua, but in our text, I don't see this in here. When he, when he gives the command to the Israelites, he doesn't say, uh, hey, this is how it's going to happen. God told Joshua, but Joshua didn't necessarily tell them. He just said, hey, we're going to get up on Monday morning. We're going to march around the city. Hey, we're going to get up on Tuesday morning. We're going to do the same thing. Spoiler alert, same thing on Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We're going to walk around that city all this time, and we're going to get everybody ready. We're going to carry the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to, uh, we're going to blow the trumpets. We're going to do everything every day, repeat it 
for six full days. Ready? So he said. And I think if I were a warrior, if I were excited about the promise, of it, right, that would frustrate me. That would frustrate me. The process would frustrate me. Just give it to me already. We're right here. One click and we're in. And I'm not sure completely why God did it. We all have our, we probably heard sermons on Joshua fought the bottle of Jericho 400 times in our life, right? I'm not sure completely, but I certainly know some reasons, right? What we normally do, this is what I normally do. We normally tell this story, we tell this account, and we jump right to the walls falling down, don't we? We get and say, yep, they marched around. They were excited to march around, right? They marched around. They blew their trumpets, and man, they, they just had it, and they were excited. They were the Israelites. They were going into the promised land, and we even wrote a song about it. Josh fought the battle of Jericho. Hey, anybody know that song, right? See, even the legs got going that time, right? But like, we, we, if you grew up in church at all, you know that song, don't you? It is my thought that if, if, I'm an, if I'm an Israelite, I'm like, I don't like that song. Because it doesn't really communicate the process. It doesn't communicate what we went through. It doesn't communicate what it took every day to get up and mount the horses and get everybody in proper line and March around the city and blow trumpets and whatever. Doesn't communicate what we went through for 40 years. And all you're talking about is the walls coming down, and they did come down. But I'm not sure that that's where we should start. Because there's a process. You see, what we oftentimes do, we, we quit oftentimes in our lives because we look at other people's successes and because we're not successful yet or aren't successful in the way that we thought we were in our lives, we walk away because we feel like God made other people that way and not us. And we compare what we think are our limitations and our failures to other people's successes. And here's what we do. We miss the blood, sweat, and tears of other people that have been persevering and been faithful for years. We don't consider that. We only see the highlights and we don't know the stories of personal sacrifice. We don't know the stories of personal faith. We don't recount the stories of unbelievable, unbelievable grit. We don't do that. We don't talk about it. It's not newsworthy. The only thing that's newsworthy is us speaking to the wall. I spoke to the wall, I knocked it down in Jesus' name. Does that happen? Sure. Does that happen most of the time? Nope. It doesn't, does it? So we give up because we allow our view to be limited, and many times we give up, and we end up not being sticky, and we don't find ourselves faithful because we compare our present reality with someone else's success. And we kind of grow bitter about it, don't we? We kind of resent them for it. Remember I told you in week one that when we talk about sticky, the sticky people are the easiest people to resent? Because you're comparing your lack of stickiness to their stickiness, to their success. But you don't realize that for years they've been faithful. For years they've prayed. For years they've fought for years, they've clawed, and they've hung on to the only shred of faith in their lives. And in the end, God came through, and they took the reality that you need to persevere seriously, and they just hung on to it, and they wind up someday being sticky. And they look at you and say, well, that's nice, but I'm not impressed by that anymore. But what I am, I am impressed with is the faithfulness of God in my life. And that makes them even more sticky. You see it? We oftentimes do not 
finish because our view is limited. Get it? Good. Okay, second thing. How's my time? Oh, boy. So, okay, second thing uh, is this. I lost my notes. Here we go. Uh, we quit because we don't always see movement. Uh, we don't always see movement, and so we quit. Uh, verses 8 through 14. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard, guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So we had the ark of the Lord, excuse me, carried around the city, circling it once. And then the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. But the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to camp, and they did this for six days. Now, we know the ending, don't we? Seventh day, they gave a war cry, they shouted, and the walls came crumbling, crumbling down. But this communicates a deeper sense of what was happening in the process. I just think that would be tough and frustrating. And honestly, I probably look at Joshua as an Israelite and say, Joshua, I don't know what you've been smoking. I don't know what's wrong with you. But this is silly. And dare I say, a little dumb. Now, I'm out of time, but I want to I make this point, and then we're going to quit, we're going to have communion together. Joshua did something really fascinating in that passage. He told them to not say anything. Did you catch that? I don't want you to shout. In fact, the scripture says, I don't even want you to say a word. I think that's crazy. These are warriors. That's what they do. They shout. We'll blow our trumpets. We'll let them know we're here, but we're not going to say a word until I tell you. Now, there can be theological reasons around that, but trusting God, and, you know, and I, I know there, 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 there are really, really good reasons behind all of that. Can I give you what I would just call a metaphorical application to this? Yes? Okay. Sometimes we just need to shut up and march. That's it. Ready to pray? You need to persevere. And sometimes we just need to shut up and march. Sometimes we need to shut up and pursue our children, even when we don't agree with what's going on. Sometimes we need to shut up and pursue our spouses. We need to shut up and pursue our purity. We need to shut up and be faithful. And I know that kind of message isn't real popular in the culture today because, because it, you know, you know, you do you, and it's all about, you know, whatever. I understand that. But following Jesus isn't about us. Following Jesus is all about the Lord and the gospel. Following Jesus is making more of him and less of, not, and less of us. Following Jesus is about promoting the glory and the majesty of the one whose image we've been created in. Following Jesus is all about making him greater. And if he leads us through a process we don't like, we can complain and we can fight and we can shake our fists. We can do all we want to do. But at the end of the day, God says, I know you don't like it. Shut up and march. Because I am bigger, I am greater, my purpose is working, and nothing that happens in this world is going to thwart what I am doing. 
Why did you quit marching? Why? You see, I think all of us, and I'll close with this, I think all of us need to have a towel. Uh, I, I saw this illustration. This is a great illustration. I wish it was mine. It's not. But I read a lot. Uh, but I want to get a towel now, right? Here's my Christmas present, family. I want a towel that just has on it uh, grit or, or a towel that says, I'm doing a great work and cannot come down. Something. And I'm going to put it in my office because here's what this towel is. This towel represents your purpose. This towel represents what God has uniquely called you to pursue. This towel represents your path that you were once passionate about. This towel represents the reality that every so often, we just want to throw it in, don't we? Every so often, we just want to take the towel that we carry and throw it in and be done. But what the towel represents is what God has called you to, what God is leading you to, what God is, is encouraging you to, per, to persevere in. What is that thing? It's your towel. That towel is used while you're persevering and pursuing faithfulness to wipe your brow when you're sweating, to clean you up when the war gets difficult. It's a symbol of God's presence and work in your life. You see, there are many that have come today, and I know this in our church, we're large enough to know this, that some of you are just ready to throw in the towel. In the name of my Lord Jesus, please don't. Your view is limited. And sometimes you're not going to see God's movement. And God says, shut up and march. My promise will be true. You need to verse persevere. Don't quit. Don't quit. Turn to the person to your right and say, don't quit. Some of you turn left. It's your other left, right? Look at him and say, don't quit. Now everybody turn to the left and say, don't quit. All right. Give him a high five. Go ahead. Give him a high five. You can do that. We can do that in church. All right. We need to be faithful. We need to persevere. It's going to make you sticky. Get it? Good. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Joshua. Thank you for the Israelites. Thank you that uh, we can see these incredible principles represented in scripture. We love you and we thank you. God, I am tempted so many times to throw in the towel. I am tempted so many times to uh, quit. But Lord, uh, I don't want to. I want to be a sticky man over my lifetime and I want to pursue you and I know that means me being faithful. Give me the strength. It's a completely spiritual thing. Give my friends and family represented in this room the strength and the faith that they need to follow you wholeheartedly for all of their lives. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.